Welcome to the LSE for this hybrid event. My name is Monica Krauss and I'm a professor of sociology here in the department at the LSE and I'm very pleased to be here today to welcome Professor Richard Sennett to both our audience here in the auditorium and our online audiences. Richard Sennett is one of the world's most eminent sociologists, urbanists and social theorists. He has written many very important books including The Hidden Injuries of Class, The Fall of Public Man, The Corrosion of Character, The Culture of the New Capitalism, The Craftsman, and Building and Dwelling. He has received the Hegel Prize, the Spinoza Prize, and the Centennial Medal from Harvard University. He has had a long association with the LSE, which many of, here, uh, of us here are very proud of, and he has been a brilliant teacher and mentor to different generations of LSE students. He's currently an honorary fellow at the LSE and a visiting professor of urban studies at Harvard University. Today, Richard will speak to us about his new book, The Performer, Art, Life and Politics. The book has just come out. And in this book, Richard discusses performances with characteristic attention to materiality, social form, intersubjective needs, and political tragedy. Details about the book can be found in the event listing, and there's also a book signing after this event. I must also tell you that if you're using X, the hashtag for today's event is at LSE Senate. The event is being recorded, and I hope we'll be able to make a podcast available, but we're always told to tell you to not promise this because there might be technical difficulties that get in the way of this event and, and its future recorded version. As usual, you'll have a chance to ask questions following um, Richard's talk, both online and here in the room. If you're joining us online, you can submit your questions via the Q&I feature at the top left of your screen. Questions. Um, will be read out in this room, and we would ask that you let us know your name and your affiliation, if any. We're always particularly keen to hear from students and alumni, so do let us know. For those of you here in the theater, I will let you know when we will open the floor to discussions. If you can raise your hands and wait for the microphone, I will ask you also to mention your name and affiliation, if relevant. I'm now delighted to hand over to Richard Sennett for his talk. Well, thank you very much, and it's very nice to be back. I haven't been back here for, uh, really, for about a decade. The school looks totally transformed, thanks to Ricky Burdett and uh, other people who have, who have uh, reorganized it. Uh, what I thought I'd do is read for about 45 minutes, and then you'll tell me why it's all wrong. Yes. And uh, then... Uh, there is a book signing. The book is, is so cheap <laughs> that, uh, you know, get one for your mother or something, something like that as well. So let me read you this text first, which will give you an idea of what, what I've been concerned about in, in doing this book. All the world's a stage. Shakespeare has the melancholy Jacques declaring as you like it. It's an old thought stretching back to antiquity, is when the Roman poet Juvenal declared, all Greece is a stage and all Greeks are actors. Today, the old thought conveys a chilly warning. Demagogues like Donald Trump and Boris Johnson are skilled entertainers, and they rule by acting. These demagogues are solo performers, uh, uh, having focused all attention on themselves as stars. Now, theater in society has a much wider compass, however. It connects rituals in religion to the role-playing, which organizes street life to the fevers of stock markets and the exchanges between buyers and sellers. I'm going to focus on one connection between politics and theater, which happens to relate to my own biography. 
Uh, I began adult life as a professional cellist, and then due to a hand injury, had to put music aside. I became a sociologist and of cities and a consultant to the United Nations. My life hasn't been quite schizophrenic, nearly, but not quite. I've always suspected that there are links between high art and politics, but for a long time couldn't tease these out. In my new wonderfully inexpensive book, The Performer, Life, Art, and Politics, I've now tried to do so. And I, to make clear to you what I'm after in this book, I want to present to you the experience which a few years ago kick, sort of kick-started my thinking about how art and politics performance in art and in politics relate. Uh, and I'm going to, the first part of this talk is about a theater of climate change denial. My career at the UN reached its apogee at a global climate summit held in Glasgow in 2021. In preparation for Glasgow, I went to Washington two years earlier to meet a group of climate scientists whom the arch climate change denier Donald Trump had let go after their years of government service. Our commiserations happened to coincide with a, climate, uh, a conference of climate deniers. And being curious, I went to that gathering as well. The most striking group attending this climate deniers convention were some young, rather well-dressed students. During a tea break, a young woman next in line to me helped me to forbidden sugar. Earnest and soft-spoken, she proved nothing like the stereotype of an intolerant right-winger. After she asked what I did, and I mentioned the words United Nations, she nodded politely. To paper over this unfortunate revelation, she began, as Americans will do when meeting strangers, to tell me about herself. A libertarian, she was majoring in Ayn Rand's studies at a local college. <coughs> she had come with a dozen or so classmates to whom I was introduced in turn and with whom I then had lunch. Ayn Rand, it transpired, had a lot to do with her interest in climate change. Rand's doctrines are all about, is, I'm telling you things you probably know, are all about individual initiative, and students majoring in Ayn Rand's studies are likely to discredit uh, forces like climate change, which are beyond uh, personal control. At lunch, they evinced a certain open-mindedness, which went beyond politeness. They did not dismiss as fake news my explanation of why each decimal point uh, matters in global warming. But the open-mindedness lasted only until we adjourned for the big events in the ballroom. Then malign powers of theater seized hold of the kids, turning them into an acid, angry crowd. Charts flashed by on a giant screen as each speaker proclaimed some version of the science is a fraud, the fraudsters were absent figures, professors from Harvard and MIT, professional do-gooders at the Rockefeller Foundation, Hewlett was not mentioned, uh, and of course, us UN bureaucrats. The charts were often too difficult to read, but no matter. The Ayn Rand study group, so restrained outside, at first just smiled at the familiar mantra of it's fake science, then began to clap, then to chant the, from, chant the familiar words, fake news, fake, fake. My companion, her eyes now streaming from excitement, removed her spectacles. How did art wind them up? Now, I, let's take a, a simple example. The call and response exchanges between a uh, performer and audience. There are, these are interactions across the footlights in which the speaker shouts out a verbal prompt and the audience completes it. In the popular theaters of the 19th century, for instance, 
where people often knew their Shakespeare by heart, an actor might prompt to be, and the audience would respond, or not to be. The art in call and response consists of how these exchanges are timed. By pausing for a moment before delivering his cue words, the actor playing Hamlet alerts the audience that their moment is at hand. So too at the climate denier conference, the skilled speakers flashing up the illegible charts would then pause for a moment before pronouncing the cliche, it's fake science, and the audience would pick up on this pause to chime in. In musical <coughs> terms, what's happening is the use of rubato, which means making minute changes in pulse, delaying or speeding up just a bit in order to emphasize and so engage the listener. In music, rubato has to be applied carefully. It can't be exaggerated and must seem to come spontaneously from the performer's own feeling at the moment. I'm sorry to say that this is an illusion. Years can be spent, as I spent them, calculating rubato in the Bach cello suites, pieces which would die if they were played with the strictness of a metronomic pulse. Rubato in speech prompts the question of why is the speaker going faster or is slowing down? It draws attention to the moment. In political theater, the effective use of rubato makes the difference between a compelling call and response and an engagement which falls flat. In British terms, this is the difference between Rishi Sunak, who has a tin ear, and Boris Johnson, whose pauses and seeming stutters in fact constitute his impeccable sense of timing. And I suspect that Johnson's rubato, like his disheveled hair, has been carefully contrived and that over time he has practiced and perfected stuttering in order to then pour out his words in a rush. Now, body language instances another artful domain to all uh, performers, and I'll take another one of these micro examples. In politics, body language is more complex than envisioned by ancient students of rhetoric. They focused on gestures which correlate to distinct verbal messages, a hand over the heart when the speaker wants to communicate sincerity, a jabbing finger to indicate anger. But at the climate change denial conference, the most effective speaker used a seemingly simpler, but in fact more complex kind of body language. He shifted his weight from foot to foot as he spoke, seeming just to relieve the tension of standing up upright for a long time. However, these shifts in weight were coupled was looking at a different space of the auditorium. So it'd be like this. That made the movement expressive. Release of tension in the body signaled awareness of you or you. It might seem a trivial matter, but as it were, the buttock to eye coupling is an effective way of engaging the spectator. I release myself, couples with. Uh, I recognize you. This coupling has an artistic root. In music, confined to a chair, we have to learn when to disperse tension. Shifting buttock weight in the middle of a phrase keys up both the player and the watcher. Um, whereas if it occurs at the end of a phrase, it relaxes both. In music, the action of looking more largely organizes space. By staring ahead or up into the lights in the stage or looking away from the hands, the audience will pick up that something is arousing the performer. The pianist Artur Rubinstein, who seldom made big body shifts, was however a master of opening and closing his eyes, looking now into the audience 
now at the key, keyboard, and now up to the stage lights. His ever restless eyes were hypnotic to watch. Now, I've gone into these minor, seemingly minor, um, minute manners, matters, because they have a, a larger significance, as came home to me in Washington. And this is the point of this. Bodily expression can translate, can transcend verbal content. It can elevate cliched, familiar words so that they seem fresh and pregnant. This bodily force occurs in any political performance, rather whether it's of the right or of the left. But transcending tired words has particularly served the extreme right, whose messages do not bear too much rational scrutiny. And just here lies the problem for the left. I'm assuming this is the LSE I know I'm talking about all of us. And just here lies the problem for the left. We've assumed that just because we have the better arguments and the better policies, we will win over the public. We won't, because politics is a theater, not a seminar. Now, I'd like to say something, secondly, about the, I'm very, very long-winded, so bear with me. I'd like to say something about impersonation. Impersonation means that an actor puts on a mask, playing a role which is unlike his or her everyday behavior. Impersonation can take two forms. In the one, the actor is conscious of playing a part and can separate him or herself from it. In the other, the actor is consumed by the role, losing that consciousness. This difference came to the fore in the writings and life of Niccolò Machiavelli, the great Renaissance theorist of political theory, of political theater. Machiavelli's essay, uh, The Prince, argues that a ruler must put on a mask in order to survive. The prince has to pursue policies such as raising taxes or forming alliances, which his subjects would resist if he presented them openly. If he is to be free to act rationally behind the scenes, he must appear unpredictably before the curtain. His sudden shifts diverting his subjects from his policies, throwing them off balance. One week he seems furious in order to inspire fear among his subjects. The next week he prizes them as would a loving father. What will the prince do or say next? The people can't predict. The prince keeps his subjects riveted, that is, by a persona because it is shape sifting, shape sifting, never becomes stale. Still, he needs to keep his own head clear, not to be swept away by the disturbances he inspires. And this, I believe, is part of the secret of uh, Trump's um, uh, in his early years, his, his ability to mesmerize audiences because he was unpredictable from moment to moment. That's hard now. But it was uh, from a song a few times perform in the flesh. It was amazing. You never knew what was going to happen next. So you were there, you know. Whereas somebody reading out a speech like me, in which is now point three of my policy. <laughs> the need to wear a mask, derived from Machiavelli's own experience as a senior diplomat, involved in negotiations in which Florence was either betraying or being betrayed by other city states. Somewhat surprisingly, the prince doesn't really analyze the techniques of deceiving well of lying convincingly to the public. Machiavelli, however, was the author of plays like Mandragola, which anatomized how husbands get away with infidelity in domestic life. We can only infer that he must have thought that deceiving a husband or a wife deploys the same skills as those which can gull the public. This is not nice Machiavelli. The performer is detached from his role 
and so he can, can uh, deceive in the boardroom on campaign trail as in the bedroom by disorientation. The other form of impersonation emerged when the great statesman fell from power. In the wake of one of Florence's many political upheavals, Machiavelli was dismissed from office and briefly went to jail. Now scratching out a bare existence on a farm outside the walls of Florence, each evening he put on the robes he used to wear when he was a high official. Donning the robes, he time traveled backward to the distant past so as no longer to feel in disgrace. Uh, in a letter to his friend Francesco Vittori, written at the end of 1513, he said, I forget all my troubles by impersonation. I do not dread poverty. I am not terrified by death. By death. I absorb myself completely into my role. The statesman, that is, was transformed by his acting. In his case, the transformation solaced him, if only for an hour. And losing oneself in a role happens more largely, of course, than in politics. It happens in most religious rituals, which transform the players chanting, swaying, or praying. But in politics, the transformation, the transforming power of performance is related to the experience of charisma a word which at its religious origins meant the gift of grace, the gods or God speaking through a person. In secular life, this puissance seemed to come from the performer's own character rather than from the gods, or in Machiavelli's case, from the spirits of the dead. A charismatic performer seems endowed with a commanding personal presence. You feel at the moment a great actor steps out from the wings. And in music, the charismatic performer can be somebody who pulls off incredible technical feats with no uh, seeming visible effort. Now, journalists make too much of personal charisma. It's easier to write about a larger, seemingly larger than life figure than about someone ordinary like us. And charisma is the only aspect of political theater which matters in the news cycle. Only the trumps of this world grab attention. But missing in this formulation is the other half of any performance which concerns the spectator, or I should say the spectators, because the dynamics of crowds shape how an audience responds to whomever's on stage. Uh, I'm going to just talk to you about, a little about the willing suspension of disbelief in crowds. In Hamlet, Gertrude stands only 10 feet away from Hamlet, but she doesn't hear him musing out loud as we do. A soliloquy asks the audience to believe that this is possible, to accept the physical impossibility to ex suspend in the theater, disbelief. The romantic era poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge invented the phrase, the willing suspension of disbelief, to signal a big sociological fact. Religious truths can't be proven or disproven. Things can need to be, they only can be taken on faith. That is, religion requires the willing suspension of disbelief. Coleridge worried that science was weakening the impulse to take things on faith. A generation after Coleridge, the philosopher T.H. Huxley uh, once asked, once you've read Darwin, how could you ever imagine that God had created the world in seven days? For this reason, Huxley coined the word agnostic, the 19th century word, which is meant to counter <coughs> the willing suspension of disbelief. Now, art, so Coleridge argued, has to do the work of taking things on faith, which religion once did. Art has to conquer and counter the agnostic's skepticism 
are strengthening people's willingness to believe in higher truths. The willingness to sp suspension of belief in politics is something which, however, comes from the structure of crowds rather than from the gods. A seemingly small but pregnant fact about the kids in Washington embodied this collective suspension of disbelief. When the assembly ended, the kids' calm good manners and seriousness returned. Indeed, in another tea break, although I was longing for a martini instead of tea after all the bilge poured out on stage, my companions acknowledged rather shamefacedly that climate change is a real threat. What's pregnant in this change is that two psychologies seem to be at work. Uh, one, triggered by the charismatic performer on stage in which people let go emotionally, and the other, off stage, in which there's a more rational and less bonded understanding. And this is the difference between individual and collective psych, uh, social, uh, and social psychology. It was for Freud the reason why the two, uh, uh, the, the, that you can't reason from how an individual feels or thinks about how a group does. And this for a frightening reason. In a crowd, people become anonymous and so can, can let their demons out as they would not if they were to be personally identifiable and so could be held to account. This explanation, these two psychologies, uh, could be applied to the violent riot against the United States election in, in 2020. Many of the protesters who had smashed windows or ripped up furniture in the Capitol were later surprised that they'd done so. In Freud's terms, they had literally lost consciousness of themselves. Um, for one of Freud's mentors, the historian Gustave Le Bon, theater plays an essential role in triggering this loss of consciousness. His book, The Crowd, is a neglected masterpiece of collective psychology. In it, Le Bon traces how theater of the violent sort emerges from rumors. As they pass from mouth to mouth, rumor enlarges into fantasies, it, uh, big and exciting, things which surpass rational understanding. In Washington, the crowd believed the rumor that the vice president had been strung up from a gallows, even though the gallows were visibly factually empty. Remember that photograph of, of the gallows waiting for the <coughs> vice president. This fantasy was believed because it was so exciting, so dramatic. Another way to put Le Bon's idea is that theater is the trigger which turns a crowd into a mob. In one way, the Freud Le Bon view is nonsense. Audiences do not become violent when they clap wildly for a performance of the Brahms' first piano concerto, a work filled with extreme passion. What I think Freud and Le Bon are onto is that a crowd does not necessarily need a leader in order to succumb to political theater. That's, that's the point of this. It has a hunger to believe in something, a sheer need for faith, no matter what the content. And this will to believe is collective and blind rather than individual and judgmental. So argue the Grand Inquisitor uh, to the Jesus-like figure he has jailed in Dostoevsky's uh, The Brothers Karamazov. Against Huxley, Dostoevsky believed that, lack, that it was intolerable for most people to not have blind faith. One of the terrifying parts of, of, that, of that novel. Now, in my view, these searing judgments of group psychology don't get at the complexity of the experience, which happens in a crowd, 
like the crowd at, um, uh, at the Climate Deniers Conference. And this last section is called Knowing and Not Knowing. People do need to believe, often blindly, but they are also capable of knowing using their powers of observation and reasoning. This duality forms the basis of what has come to be known as the Cohen Arendt thesis. The thesis portrays the public as capable of both knowing and not knowing things at the same time. In the remarkable study of apartheid uh, in South Africa, the sociologist Stan Cohen, one of the lights of LSE sociology, did you study with him? Can't remember, yeah. Uh, he's an amazing colleague. The sociologist Stanley Cohn explored what the white Burr community actually knew about conditions in the townships to which the black majority uh, were confined. Cohen found that the whites, in fact, knew quite a lot about the miseries that the apartheid regime inf inflicted. But at the same time, they blotted out this awareness claiming, for instance, that they'd never heard about the typhoid epidemics which ravaged the townships. But uh, letting it, they let pop out occasionally references, even so, to the typhoid scourge. And for Cohen, the most important thing about this was that when he challenged people about this so-called contradiction, the whites said, I can't handle it. Um, that is, the more you know, the less insupportable it becomes to know. Cohen called this state of denial simultaneous knowing and not knowing. He, and it's a very radical claim, he disputed the whole notion of enlightenment, that the more you know, the more you, you're going to act rationally. He thought instead that the more people knew, the more they had to deny what they knew. It was too overwhelming. I can't handle it. Cohen's study reinforced an observation of Hannah Arendt, which she made decades before about German concentration camps. Ordinary Germans professed to know nothing about them, which Arendt didn't believe for a second. Too many Jews, Catholic resistors, homosexuals, Roma, and socialists had gone missing from the streets. It was not possible for the ordinary German not to wonder about how and where they had gone. And something like this same syndrome operated among the young climate deniers. The facts were overwhelming. Political theater enabled them to deny that reality, but it did not erase the reality. This is a matter of doubleness. Uh, as postmodern cultural theorists have called this divided consciousness. Jacques Derrida, in fact, celebrated double <coughs> consciousness as liberating. Nothing is bright and shiny and singly true. The Cohen Arendt thesis points instead to the disabling and pacifying character of double, double vision. Life is too difficult. I can't handle it. I need to deny. And in this scheme of things, art helps you to withdraw, enables the will instead to, fantas to fantasy. Now, if this um, were the end of the story, perhaps we should shut up shop on the human condition, close the LSE, and just you know, find a good uh, bar in which to drink. And I have to say that Les Cat is Clismically, people often ask me, what are the remedies uh, which could, um, for destructive political theater? In particular, how the theater might serve a more positive uh, political role. And I'll just conclude with this. Maybe I'll say this informally. It's a schoolroom error to believe that problems can be solved by policies, as though curing a disease. We should instead be thinking about resistances and countervailing forces for problems which will not go away. In America, personal charisma and the willing suspension of belief have an unshakable hold on Donald Trump's mega public. 
not his record as a convicted rapist, nor his financial crookedness, nor the passing of nuclear secrets to the Russians has dispelled his legitimacy. His followers need to believe, and indeed, the most fervent among them are evangelical Christians. They can be countered only by a massive turnout at the ballot box and the rigorous prosecution of those who are violent. In my view, force has to defeat faith. You know, it's, um, it's not a matter of enlightening them. But good-hearted souls that we are, we don't want to leave matters at this. We might want to speculate if another kind of theatrical experience could play a more positive role in politics. And I don't think it's a prejudice to think so. If you think back about the history of theater to uh, the uh, Commedia dell'arte of, uh, of the late Renaissance, these were troops of actors who made fun of politicians, always pushing the edge to see how much they could get away with, to make people laugh at politicians. The Commedia dell'arte players were not like the people who engaged in these Feast of Fools uh, theatrics where for a day or two days servants became masters and masters became servants uh, because things then went back to normal. Rather, they were disturbing presences because they got people <coughs> to laugh at faith. Uh, and that's one way in which a certain kind of theater can uh, dissolve, um, can play a, a more positive role. Another is something, if any of you have seen Angels in America, uh, you understand, which is a theater in which there are no heroes. There's no rescue. It's a dramatization of people who are surviving or not surviving, in which um, uh, there is no charismatic saving force. And it's one of the reasons that this play uh, had a transformational quality among people's thinking about, uh, about gays during, during the uh, time of the, of the um, uh, AIDS uh, epidemic. It's another kind of use of theater. Uh, both of these kinds of uses of theater are in a way attacks on the notion of the performer's competency. And that it seems to me, one by irony and jokes, the other by uh, removing from the stage anybody who is, offers a solution, that these are ways in which theatrical experience can help us counter the kind of destructive uh, theater uh, that uh, I've described in this talk. Not cure it, you know? That's the error that we like to make, um, that somehow this power can go away. This destructiveness is built into our experience of art. And all we can do is push back against it, uh, but that is quite a lot. We can push back against it, but we won't make it go away. So that's what I want to say. Thank you very much for this talk. We now look forward to your questions. If you could type short questions into the Q&A box if you are joining us online or um, raise your hands in the audience, I will perhaps take questions in twos or threes and we'll try to ask Richard to answer as many as possible. Um, also, if I can remind you, we're very much welcome if you would state your name and affiliation so we know who we're hearing from. Questions in the audience? Um, perhaps could we first take the question with the pink sweater and then the one in the back? Hi, um, my name's Heather. I'm not um, part of LSE, but um, 
I am, I'm training to be a therapist. And one of the things about thinking about the therapy room as a very staged environment and, and part of the idea, I think there is an awful lot of performance, of, of, of performing and um, uh, sort of doing from um, a person-centered approach of unconditional positive regard, which is, is always going to be a performance, because I think that's incredibly hard to have with everybody, with anybody, um, performing empathy. Um, and whether you think there is a value in this sort of more, in some ways positive, but still fundamentally performative spaces. Right. And if that is a, is, a, is a positive thing that could counter some of the ways you've talked about the, the performance of politics, or if fundamentally that performance is still harmful regardless of, of the differing intentions. Very good question. Um, sorry. Uh, in, yes, exactly. Yeah, and the yes. Hi, my name is Chen Yuan. I'm a PhD student uh, in planning and geography department at LSE. And uh, I would like to ask: Do you think it's uh, viable to make that uh, alternative theatre to become a, a policy or politics? program of relatively large scale and uh, what's the role of uh, intellectuals to promote in this? Uh -huh. Another good question. I'm back home. <laughs> uh, what I would say to you about, about this is that uh, another part of my book deals with this. I don't know if this would be a satisfying response to what you're saying or not. The notion that there is something called authentic emotion, which can be separated out from performative emotion, seems to me a great error. And uh, oftentimes in religion, for instance, uh, the whole notion is that by, you know, by praying <coughs> or participating in the mass or something like that, you come to feel things which you don't feel the moment you you step outside of that. Uh, that framework, and that's good. It makes you better when you're in it. And I think the same thing must be, I, I don't know, but I would imagine the same thing is true in your domain, that, you know, when people, um, when they perform empathy, they'll be a little transformed by the performance of it. It will be something that's positive for them. For Machiavelli, it was uh, it, it was a solace, you know. This is a ruined man. He's a dirt poor farmer. Uh, he puts on these old robes of state, and for a while he's feeling dignified again. But you know, there we have this we have this prejudice that performativity is less real, less authentic than some kind of non-performative uh, domain, which is our authentic self. I got onto this by a book you might be interested in called Sincerity and Authenticity by the literary critic Lionel Trilling, which is, um, looks at this in the history of thought about when it, when it was that we thought that what's authentically us is the us that's not performing. But, so I, I'm very sympathetic to that. About how long this lasts, I can only tell you what, uh, um, I had a long talk with Simon Sharma the other night about this. And he said that the thing about Commedia dell'arte or about plays like Angels in America, is that they're late occurrences. That is, that the manipulation has to occur and that the, the re resistance against it, uh, it comes only after the manipulation has succeeded. In Britain, that's obviously true with Brexit, which was uh, the greatest political performance of my generation here. 
by an actor who absolutely didn't know the day before he had two speeches, whether he was pro or anti-Brexit. You know this. That, and he thought, well, this one will get me far. Uh, and, but it, you know, it, now we're making fun of him. But it's, it's, uh, this is Simon's view of this. You have to go through the experience of being tricked in order, or being hurt, in order then to respond in these counter theatrical ways. Which is, a, that's a hard truth, you know? Um, it was, um, so uh, I would say that's, you know, it's not inevitable, but it has a time framework. It's, it's, it's part of disillusion. Can I follow up? Because I understood the question to also be about scale. And so the question is, do the We're counter We're always so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what you mean, you. Tell oh. me, uh, this is my former student, uh, my best <laughs> former student. What do you mean by scale? Um, I, I, no, just say what you mean. <laughs> the question of scale is, you know, do the counter performances scale up so well as the demagog demagogic performances? Is, is, is there an advice? How ah, do we I scale see. up? How do we respond to the, That's what to the force in numbers that demagoguery can produce? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it's, uh, I, I mean, I think what we're living through is a kind of basic truth that uh, destructiveness is more prevalent in human affairs than constructiveness. And part of that is that uh, uh, artists are not, the, as Shelley thought, the legislators of humanity. But that's where we're at, you know? And it's at least, it's something, but I would say that it doesn't scale up, if you want to use that word, to the same level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have an online question? Um, yeah, so this question is from an anonymous user. They have asked... Oh, not nice. <laughs> <laughs> they have said, thank you so much for speaking. Um, would you say that the collective need of faith, believing in things, are similar to Dirk Heim's concept of effervescence? Oh, good question. Why anonymous? He should have identified himself. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, Durkheim it had a great struggle with the notion of blind faith. It, and uh, it, in part it was because he believed that organic solidarity, not mechanical solidarity, just performing a task, but something where you really threw your, your heart and soul into it came from suspending yourself. So he's close to, he's close to Le Bon, whom he knew and hated, uh, it, in that, that there's a kind of loss of self. But what he was interested in is he didn't, the complexity with him is that he didn't think that if you didn't have this effervescence, which is this blind faith, that reason alone would sustain social reform. So the contradiction is the energy for social reform comes from something which is not self-critical. And that's, you know, that's why he's an adult uh, social thinker rather than a, a, school, a school teacher. You know? It's uh, that, uh, put it another way, that rationality is not energizing. Yeah. It's a very counter-enlightenment idea. Um, we have a question in the second row. The white shirt who's been... No, oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. One of the other. Yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted in, uh, given the complexity of the world, uh, in a kind of democratic system, 
Do you think there's any alternative to using art and theatre as a means of communication? Like, it would be quite hard for us as the electorate, you know, to process maybe all of the minutiae of the EU or climate change. Yeah. So is there an alternative to, to art and theatre? Well, we've, to, to we've, we've had it, which is uh, the kind of surrender of... It's not democracy, but it's it's a kind of version of of of, of, uh, of representation, which is in theory supposed to do exactly that, where we don't have to animate the passions in order to act. That's you know that's why there are political chambers. Uh, it's giving away that passion. Uh, this is in the American system. This is what the framers of the American Constitution imagined, that representative democracy diminishes uh, the, the destructiveness of crowds. It quite worked out that way, but it's, I think it's more likely to do that than popular democracy where you're, you're getting an immediate response from an audience. Right? This way you have a baffle. Um, but we're really threatened by that now because um, it's a whole other, other story that that notion of giving over your agency to somebody else is breaking down, in, in, particularly in Britain. Uh, you know, it's become a, a way of exploiting the public rather than representing them. But that, that, that was the theory, at least. I have many hands. So um, if you could ask your question, then in the very last row. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sennett, for that. Uh, um, my name is David Harris, uh, and I'm a, a visitor uh, to the LSE this evening. I wanted to ask you, um, is, there, is, is it a case of uh, source for the goose is source for the gander here. Um, I, I, I and many people here, and I suspect from what you were saying, you uh, can uh, be, be quite sniffy about uh, Boris Johnson and Donald Trump and, uh, 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 and uh, many other quite theatrical uh, uh, political performers, but perhaps rather like uh, John Kennedy and uh, 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 um, uh, Martin Luther King and uh, uh, even uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I try to think of, of a past prime minister who, who is quite uh, lucid. Uh, but is it is it is it just a case of Macmillan? Would, sorry, Macmillan. Macmillan. Well, also, and Tony Blair w w was a, was a great performer. Yeah. I, I, I think. Is it just the case that um, that uh, uh, what source for the goose is source again? That there isn't any. That it's it's a false. That we like only those performers who we kind of agree with, and we, we, and we don't see that as performing, but, uh, but those that we don't like, we, we, uh, uh -huh. we think, oh, they're just performing. There isn't any substance in, in them. Okay. Thank you. And then in the last row, thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Zulam, and I graduated from the LSE in 2018. Thank you for your talk this evening. I wanted to ask you, to what extent do you think the modern media landscape is deterministic of this sort of performance? Um, it certainly seems yeah. to me as a Gen Z millennial that social media and cable television is pretty much built for entertainment. And if we are turning modern dialogue into a circus, should we be surprised that clowns rule the roost at the end of the day? These people have great lines. Um, their uh, quotes and so on will be played back because it gets ratings at the end of the day. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Jeffrey Zucker, who ran CNN during the Trump era. Right. He was formerly at, uh, he, he did a lot of reality television at ESPN, and he used a lot of those techniques, you know, the countdown clock, the yeah. uh, both sides being represented, even if one side is extremely underqualified, just to have a shouting match. And you've got CNN with the 10 screens with different people shouting over each other. It's great, it's great TV, but is that poisoning our politics? Yeah, that's a great question. Can I? Uh, respond to that one in order to respond to you. I think this is, uh, it's not in my 
book, but it's been very much in my thoughts. Uh, and I didn't write about it because I'm uh, in incompetent and I, I, in using a computer. I don't, uh, I sort of use Twitter, but I don't do WhatsApp. I, you know, it's, but what has struck me is that it is a totally different kind of theater which disaggregates time in social media. It's very short. And it means that a whole different set of communications and messaging can go on. That you, you've sat through a 45 minute speech that takes effort on your part, right? Not too much, I hope. Uh, but you know what I mean? Whereas um, uh, with TV ads, which I think are halfway to what you're talking about, the notion is that nothing goes on too long and that there's an image that often takes the place of words or um, uh, a little drama that's uh, portrayed. That, and that's a kind of disaggregation of consciousness which I don't think we really understand how to deal with. I certainly don't. But I think it's something new. And what's different from what I've been talking about is that it's disengaged in a way. It's a much more passive. There isn't knowing and not knowing. Uh, in that formulation, you don't know because you can't bear the truth. You can't handle it. Whereas, you know, seeing these little spot ads, there's no demands made on you. But I think there's a whole, if you were going to write a book about this, <laughs> this would be just what it would be great. What time, what is happening to time under this new conditions of performing uh, online? Um, uh, it's a very peculiar combination, isn't it? it? You create, as it were, a kind of cliche world that you know about, you're unthinking about, and never makes too many demands on you. And that's, I would say, I haven't answered your question, but it's a, it's a great one. But I would say that's, look, I'm prejudiced about this. I, I think on the whole that what demagogues do is they don't want people to think too much about what they're saying. Whereas that wasn't the case with, uh, in my youth, with somebody like Kennedy, who was engaged people to think about what he was saying. Martin Luther King, the same sort of thing. Uh, there wasn't a kind of blank out of, you know, when you listened, you thought about what you heard. And that's, that's not what demag demagoguery is about. It's, it's more like uh, the, uh, the issue that raised by the gentleman at the back, that, you know, you're, you're, you're not thinking. And unfortunately, that works very well modern times. So I don't think it's goose and gander, or rather that we ganders, or let's say we gooses, are, you know, are, are, um, there's more substance to what we're doing. I, I don't think it's just on the one hand and on the other. We have questions from online audience members. Um, so the first question is from Alison. And she says, it seems that theatre within politics is and always has been harmful. The performance of politics is not aligned to the delivering of effective social policy, which is often not interesting or newsworthy. What can we do to ensure that politics isn't perpetuating cultures of denial, but is meeting human need? I suppose, is the performativity of politics harmful? And then the second question is from Antonio in Italy. And he says, do you think that the scale of political theater is increasing? Well, again, I'll, I'll re reverse this. Uh, I think it's uh, a kind of mindless political theater is increasing with the, with the uh, development of these uh, new technologies. I, what I was trying to say in my lecture, just to respond to the first question that you were that was sent in, was that it's not a question of, of uh, 
curing a, a disease. This is endemic to social, uh, to political reality. It's and it's a disease that you, you could say is chronic, uh, but is not al always fatal. But the notion that I, um, that there's somehow, you know, in our wisdom, we could come up with ways of theater proofing people so that they didn't respond like this, you know, that they were indifferent to it. That seems to me just unreal, you know. We have to look at it as a different thing. This is something systemic in us, uh, this surrender. Uh, and particularly the, the Cohen Arendt thesis, I, I think, is systemic in all polities, which is the more reality you're faced with, the more uh, you feel you, you can't handle it, you know? And that's just where we are, that's, that's real life. Um, we're supposed to be disciplined on time. We are disciplined on time. You're always disciplined. <laughs> I'm not disciplined, but you're disciplined. Um, there are two questions in the first row, so why don't we take them together? It's coming. Um, yeah. Owen Moore from The Observer. Um, you wrote very memorably in The Fall of Public Man about the virtuoso, about a performer yeah. who turns performance, which should be a mutual and collective activity, into a singular and solipsistic activity. Um, so I'm wondering to what, what is the similarity or difference between a virtuoso and a demagogue? And linked to that is I don't understand, I don't think you're saying that, that performance and theatre is a terrible thing. I think you're saying there are differences between good and bad performance. Yeah. And um, could you elaborate on that? Okay. Actually, this may be a variation on the same question, sort of. So, but I want to, I guess I want to push um, beyond sort of performance is an inevitable element of democratic culture uh, to say it's actually a necessary and a good thing. Emotions are a good thing. That is to say, it's a very strange notion of democracy to think that it is supposed to be completely reasonable and rational and that the entry of emotion into it to help yeah. guide our choices is in fact a bad thing that we would control if we could, but we're stuck with it, so we should figure out what we want to do. I, I, I dare say anyone in this room, if they get in an argument with somebody else, about something they care about does not sit there in some, I, this once happened to me, I had this argument about the role of emotion in democratic politics with Chris Eisgruber, who oh. was taking the position that, this was back at NYU, yeah. he was taking the position that, like, it, you know, no, it was all about deliberative democracy, it's about rationality and reason, and he got like red in the face, he was pushing so hard because he cared about the point, to which I said, yeah. this is the point. And so the, the question is not whether emotions are, a, a, a good thing, I think they are, uh, an important part of what makes us human, um, but whether we have our institutions structured so that we can wean out the, the demagogues who will use that for bad ways. With the framers of our constitution, that was actually what they were trying to do. And they structured institutions in ways, if you say Madison's Federalist 10 or whatever, were designed to what they believed would screen out the demagogues and worked fairly effectively for a long time in the breakdown in the last 30 to 50 years has been in the institutions that used to work to do that. And that's where then, uh, you know, arguably yeah. we would need to be looking to fix the problem. Very, yeah. Absolutely. I, I think the, uh, of course, I mean, you know, a bloodless, uh, a bloodless politics is a, is a dead politics. I guess the question to me is, and that's why I'm so interested in this crowd stuff as, as Freud and Le Bon talked about it, is that once you are in, in a situation in which you can't be held accountable for what you think or feel, uh, that things are let out that otherwise wouldn't be, I, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about another thing with Hannah Arendt. She wrote her her first book 
was called Love in St. Augustine. And uh, she was a Zionist at that point. Anyhow, she wrote it because she was interested in the way in which um, generosity and empathy get perverted in time. And her argument was that the larger the scale of the religious structure, the more this perversion would occur because people couldn't identify with others in particular. They became what she called ge generically empathic. And at that point, she thought it, w it could be perverted. And maybe what the issue here is uh, that you're raising is what are the conditions under which people are still recognizable themselves in expressing something like generosity or anger, something like that, uh, rather than uh, getting lost in this kind of generic uh, crowd function. Is that theater? It's certainly emotional. But is it theater? I'm not so sure it is. I think theater crosses the line always when it's impersonal, you know? And that's when the danger starts to me. But maybe I'm wrong about this, but that's, it seems to me the issue here is whether you are identifiable as an actor, literally that it's you who are feeling this rather than us. That's why identity politics is so theatrical in a bad way, you know? Because I'm not speaking, I'm speaking in terms of a category, you know? Um, about this question of virtuosity, well, you know what I think <laughs> about that, that all, uh, it's something that, I, just coming back to where I started, as, music, as a musician, I was never a virtuoso. And so I had a love-hate relationship to people who were, many of whom I went to conservatory with. Um, and, uh, but I did see that one thing that uh, people with more limited gifts like myself had was that we were drawing less attention to we focused more on the music and less on our our musical pre our presence. Again, as individuals, you know. So, I mean, I think all virtuosity is is prone to this this danger, but it's certainly not the only way that you make art. A string quartet is uh, there are, you know, superstar performers in it, but they, superstar string quartet performances tend to be not very satisfying. So, but, but as I said, this is a, a bias based on uh, long and bitter love-hate experience with people who could do, could do this. I, just to finish this up in, in a way, I. What has been on my mind in writing this book? I mean, the politics is, is very important to me uh, about it. But the, um, the, it was really a moral issue that got me going on this, which is how do we find a, uh, a society in which people are more modest, you know? Uh, mo uh, Trump is obviously not modest, but there's something about the organization of political theater, theater which, which destroys the notion of modesty. Uh, even when people dramatize it, you know, there's something about that. But that's really what I'm interested in in this book. How do we have a theater which is, which is, is not so egoistic? And what does that mean about performing with other people, um, and, and so on? So, uh, as I say, I hope you buy the book and you know, <laughs> argue with me, get your mother to argue with me, and so, and so on. But anyhow, thank you so much for coming. I, I'm going to sign books outside so we can continue the discussion out there. But thank you for coming.